Bueno, eh, buenos días, tardes o noches a todas las personas que se están conectando desde distintas partes del mundo. Eh, bienvenidas a este primer evento de la serie de seminarios sobre cuidado, ciudad y capital social, financiada por la Fundación de Estudios Urbanos, Urban Studies Foundation. Primero que todo, quería decirles que hay traducción simultánea entre inglés y español, entonces como la conferencia va a ser en inglés, en, en la parte de abajo, al lado de reacciones, hay un, un botón que es como un globo. Ahí pueden eh, oprimir para seleccionar el canal de su preferencia. Eh, good morning, afternoon or, or evening to all of you which, uh, who are joining us from different parts of the globe. Eh, we are delighted to host this first seminar of the seminar series eh, supported by the Urban Studies Foundation. Uh, that focuses on care, city, and social capital. First of all, I wanted to uh, let you know that we have simultaneous translation between Spanish and English. So if you want to change the language, uh, you can uh, use the button next to reactions in the menu on the, on the lower side of the Zoom window and uh, select the language of your uh, choice because we'll have a, an introduction in Spanish and then our public lecture will be in English. So I'll switch to Spanish now. Um, este, esta serie de seminarios está organizada por el Centro Interdisciplinario de Estudios sobre Desarrollo CIDER de la Universidad de los Andes en Bogotá y el George Simmel Center for Metropolitan Studies de la Humboldt Universidad Berlín en Alemania. Eh, somos un equipo de profesoras e investigadoras interesadas en analizar los vínculos entre procesos urbanos y procesos sociales, en entender el cuidado como concepto clave en estudios urbanos y en explorar las relaciones entre infraestructuras urbanas, capital social público y prácticas de cuidado de mujeres en ciudades de Europa y América Latina. El equipo está conformado por la profesora Talia Blockland, por Nina Margis, Natalia Martini y Bojin Cervetska de la Universidad Humboldt de Berlín, por las profesoras María José Álvarez y Frederick Fleischer, Sandra Pulido y por mí, Adriana Hurtado de la Universidad de los Andes en Bogotá, por la profesora Mercedes de Virgilio y Agustina Frisch de la Universidad de Buenos Aires en Argentina y por la profesora Alberta Andreotti de la Universidad Milano Bicocca en Italia. Hoy comenzamos este diálogo internacional con la conferencia a cargo del profesor Gotham Ban, que introducirá el tema del diseño y operación de sistemas de protección social a, fin, a partir de casos de ciudades en India. Eh, luego, en febrero de 2024, tendremos un seminario presencial en Bogotá, en el que vamos a explorar la relación entre infraestructuras urbanas, cuidado y cuidado. Y a finales de mayo del próximo año tendremos el último seminario de manera presencial en Berlín, donde nos enfocaremos en los vínculos entre capital social y prácticas de cuidado en encuentros públicos en, entre mujeres de eh, ciudades de América Latina y Europa. Les invitamos entonces a seguirnos en esta serie de eventos que vamos a tener. Eh, siempre vamos a tener espacios abiertos al público, conferencias, sesiones de trabajo cerradas, talleres y sobre todo actividades dirigidas a investigadoras e investigadores que comienzan sus carreras académicas. La información de estos eventos la van a encontrar en la página web y las redes sociales de la Urban Studies Foundation y de las instituciones organizadoras. En el chat les voy a pegar los links para que las tengan presentes. Eh, les recordamos nuevamente a quienes acaban de ingresar que esta conferencia tiene disponible traducción simultánea entre inglés y español. Para esto eh, les invitamos a seleccionar el canal del idioma de su preferencia, ya que la conferencia principal va a ser en inglés en el botón que tiene un globo al lado de la, del botón de reacciones en el menú inferior de la ventana de Zoom. A continuación le voy a dar la palabra a Nina Margis, que introducirá a nuestro conferencista de hoy, y al público le invitamos a que durante la conferencia del profesor Van puedan ir registrando sus preguntas por escrito en el chat, eh, pues al final tendremos una sesión primero de discusión entre el equipo participante y organizador del seminario, y luego una sesión abierta de preguntas eh, al, abierta al público. Entonces, bienvenidas, bienvenidos, eh, y adelante, Nina. Uh, muchas gracias, Adriana. Voy a continuar en inglés. Um, so, um, 
Before we start with today's public lecture, I have the pleasure to introduce our guest and speaker of today, Gautam Ban. Um, Gautam Ban is an urbanist whose work focuses on urban poverty, inequality, social protection and housing. He is currently Associate Dean at the School of Human Development, as well as Senior Lead of Academics and Research at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements in Bengaluru, India. Gautam has done a variety of research projects, so I just want to highlight the most recent ones, which include research on child health outcomes for the children of informal workers in domestic work and construction, as well as advocacy work on urban social protection regimes. In his work, Gautam connects not only a wide range of topics, but also a variety of collaborations. So he has worked and is working with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, Government of India, um, with housing right movement, movements across the country, as well as state governments in several Indian cities um, and regions. And the same idea of um, reaching out to different actors within society is also true for his publications. So on the one hand, Gautam is author of the books In the Public's Interest, Eviction, Citizenship and Inequality in Contemporary Daily. He is co-editor of the Routledge Companion to Planning in the Global South, co-author of um, Swept of the Map, Surviving Eviction and Resettlement in Delhi, and last but not least, um, co-editor of Because I Have a Voice, Queer Politics in India. So besides all these academic publications, Gautam also writes or communicates to a larger public, as he has done, for instance, as columnist with the daily newspaper, The Indian Express, or when he appeared on TED Talks India in December 2017, where he spoke about his, and I quote, bold plan to house 1 million, 100 million people, end of quote. Um, so while we might not be as many or have as much reach as a TED Talk, um, we are very happy to have you here, Gautam, and the next uh, 40 minutes um, are yours before we move on to our Q&A session. So um, thank you and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, let me just get my screen in place. Perfect. So, um, so buenos dias. Um, muchas gracias por la invitación. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, and I am going to just get into it and talk through a little bit, but I just wanted to say first that I am delighted to be invited to speak uh, in a lecture series that is themed on the idea of care. Uh, I think that particularly in the current global moment, um, even the notion of uh, solidarity, consideration, peace, and nonviolence feel like very impossibly utopic thoughts. And I think that in that moment to try and hold on to an idea of care, uh, I think is not just an intellectual or academic exercise, um, but is actually quite a fundamental ethical enterprise um, as we think about human society and global human life. Um, and I think very much that uh, the academy is usually at its best when it is able to ask questions that reflect uh, our times. Um, and as academics, we're often guilty of not quite being in step with our times. And so I think it's wonderful to see, um, to think about care as something that holds uh, a quite radical potential. Um, the word, uh, like another one of my favorite words, which is kindness, is often seen as something that is softer than stronger words about political claims. But I have always believed in the potential both of care and kindness to be quite structural forces. Um, and that's one of the reasons actually that today I want to think about care through the lens of social protection. And while it may seem like 
taking a sort of two leaps of a different kind, to me, the concepts are quite intimately related. And I'll come back at the end of my talk to actually suggest that social protection is in a way a structural expansion of the concept of care, um, and that it works very much in consonance with both the imperatives and the analytical potential of a concept like care. Um, and I'll come back to that at the end. Uh, but what I want to do today is to draw upon a recent paper that speaks as the same title as the talk, uh, which is on operationalizing social protection uh, and thinking about that from Indian cities. So I want to begin at a moment that for a lot of us in India is sort of what the anthropologist Veena Das would almost call a critical event, an event that organizes history and memory in a before and an after, right? an event that feels like a rupture, an event that feels like in many ways, something that disorganizes our given categories, um, both of everyday life, but also of the academy. Uh, and while COVID in some ways was that event, I want to refer to something specific within the pandemic and not the pandemic itself. In fact, many of us have argued that for many people in the global south, the pandemic was as much a tale of continuity as discontinuity. Um, but what I'm, what you're looking at here is a picture by the photographer S. Harpal Singh, and it is a one of many pictures that in 2021, in the beginning of India's lockdowns, were taken on our highways. And on those highways were hundreds and thousands of people who risked one of the strictest lockdowns in the world to start walking on highways because interstate transportation was shut down, often hundreds of kilometers back from cities to their villages and to native towns. And in a sense, this great reverse migration, this movement of people, to me, uh, made many of us ask a very fundamental question, which is, what were they leaving behind? And in one sense, it was impossible to think that what they were leaving was the city itself, with a certain sense of possibility about the urban. And I want to think a little bit about what this moment um, could mean uh, in our conceptualization of thinking about both care, but also about social protection, about the urban as a site of possibility, as opposed to the site of its absence. And I'll do that by doing three things in this talk. I want to set a couple of frames and a bit of a context. I want to then offer a set of empirical, what I will call puzzles, things for us to think through not detailed empirical case studies in a shorter talk, but the idea of some context that we must grapple with. And the last is to offer a kind of diagnostic to think about the idea of operationalizing social protection. So let me get to my first frame. One of the things that I want to think about when I think about care in a structural scale, think about social protection as a form of that structure, is to think about the fact that when mobilized structurally, the, both the outcome and target of both social protection as well as care must be not only to think about what we used to call poverty alleviation um, or safety nets, but in fact, to have a more radical ambition to undo inequality. Um, and I want to think then about what that inequality is. And as someone who has thought a lot with other Southern urban theorists, to me, one of the insistence of our framings must mean that we must conceptualize from place. So my first offering is to conceptualize inequality from urban India, because I don't think the word is self-evident as you move to different places. I'll make three assertions about urban inequality in India. The first is that like many other places, economic inequality in India gets a lot of attention. Uh, in fact, in recent global debates about the 1%, Thomas Piketty's work, this is true globally. But in fact, it under, we underemphasize the social, spatial, and political aspects of inequality in favor of economic inequality. And I want to mark that. The second is that in India particularly, the social, particularly structured around identity such as caste, religion, and gender, underlie economic and spatial inequality much more than we acknowledge. In fact, what a lot of what we understand as material inequality is in fact structurally social inequality, an argument made by someone like Dr. B. R. Ambedkar as early as the 1930s. The third is 
a consonant argument with many other scholars of inequality from a Southern perspective, which is that the difference of inequality in the South is that it occurs alongside persistent poverty and significant vulnerability. In fact, one of my favorite definitions of the South has always been from Abdul Malik Simon and Edgar Peterson, where they define the South as a place where the majority holds vulnerability. And I think that this idea of the South, more than any geographical assertion, is a far better marker of what we mean when we think of thinking from place. And in India, what this means is that there are two types of inequality. One is an unequal distribution of economic power. How much does the 1% own? The other is an unequal distribution of basic capabilities. And these are very different forms of inequality, even though folks like Imran Velodia and David Francis at the newly established Southern Center for Inequality Studies in Johannesburg will tell us often these two come and are driven by the same forces but they require very different forms of practice. Redistribution from the 1% is a different urban practice than raising the floor for the bottom 50%. And this is a distinction I want to hold on to because while conceptually they may be related, in operationalizing practice, they are very different moves to make in everyday life. I will focus today on one of these, which is the idea of what does social protection look like given majority vulnerability? How do we think about a place where the floor has to be raised for a majority of citizens? The second is to think about existing social protection in India. The first story is that Indian safety nets are patchworks. They are deeply flawed. They are deeply insufficient. They are frayed. They are torn. There are holes in the quilt of the safety net. One of the big problems is that our safety programs have been, like many places of the South, imagined for rural areas and have always come later into the urban. The urban is a place where growth occurs. The rural is a place where welfare is situated. This is very different from many places in the global north. We're also underlying this with overall insufficient public resources. Um, in some sectors, India underspends deeply on social protection. And this is what I'm framing as insufficient public action. The second is that debates on social protection often do not distinguish between what some scholars have called um, protective versus transformative social protection. I'll give a very quick example. Protective social protection is meant to stop destitution. It is hunger, it is nutrition, it is primary schooling. It is the basic safety nets. Transformative social protection is meant to enable socioeconomic mobility. So rent is transformative social protection, which is why it's often never considered part of a minimum safety net. Higher education is transformative social protection, which is why most social protection stops at senior high school or even primary school as a right, but not university. In India, both of these are true. And one of the contexts that I want to frame is that to combat inequality, protective social protection is insufficient. Transformative social protection is essential. The third, and this is the most important for our talk today, is that urban India is marked by what I will in shorthand call deep economic and spatial informality. I mean, two things by this. The first is that seven of 10 workers in India work in the informal economy, which means that they work either without recognized work contracts, without the standard protections of labor by law, and without recognition and registration in state databases. And this will be a very important part of where we come back to. The second is that these same workers often live in housing that is equally, to quote Teresa Caldera, the Brazilian anthropologist, in tension with the official logics of property law and planning. We can think of these as informal settlements. There are words for them in every language, but basically they lack both security of tenure as well as, as I'll come back to later, a notion of an official proof of legitimate residence. And the third is that this means that questions of visibility and recognition are at the heart of a lot of India's employment and labor markets, as well as our housing markets. And this is something we'll come back to a lot. The final protect, the question I want to raise is the question of social protection is who claims care? Who claims social protection? And who do we claim as? And the distinction between social protection for beneficiaries 
for citizens and for workers, as many people on this call know, is one of the oldest debates on the distinction between social security as a right and social protection as welfare. And the political implications of this are something that I'm interested in deeply. Today, I will focus on what economic and spatial informality do to the operationalizing of social protection. And I want to say something about this word operational. Too often, our knowledge focuses on the diagnostic and the analytical, but too little of our attention is focused on a specific form of knowledge on what we need to know in order to know not why we do things or what we should do, but in fact, how to do them. In this way, many of the debates have distinctions between theory and practice, between thinking and doing, and I'd like to say actually thinking, doing, and feeling, are then enshrined into our knowledge systems. And in many ways, the operational is seen as a lesser site of academic knowledge, or not even in some cases, the work of the academy. And I think that what's critical is that the academic knowledge production on social protection must take the operational deeply seriously, but also know that it requires perhaps a different skill set from us, because it requires both an empirical specificity to context, something that works in one place will not work elsewhere, but it also requires an ability to make deeply imperfect choices with deep constraints, which means win-win situations are very rare. And how we make such trade-offs that practice requires is something that requires more attention and contribution from academic scholarship and communities. My last frame before I get to the puzzles is the question of how one assesses social protection. Here I borrow from the work of Smitha Srinivas, who offers a very useful way of thinking about how social protection has historically been delivered. She argues that there are three major traditions, particularly in social protection as understood in its history as emerging in industrialized North Atlantic, particularly Europe. The idea of place that is delivered where you live on the basis of your presence, residence or citizenship there. The idea of work, that it is given to you because you are a worker on the basis of claims of labor and the idea of the workplace that in many cases becomes the site of delivery. Therefore, formal employees that work like me in formal universities get labor protections via the university as opposed to via our citizenship. This means that social protection has long had a distinction between what are sometimes called citizenship-based rights or universal rights versus labor-based rights or workers' rights. And I'll come back to this distinction, but I'm going to use this idea of place, work, and workplace to organize the empirical information that follows next. Let me get to place. What you're seeing on the slide is work that was done by colleagues of mine at the Indian Institute of Human Settlements with the, with the Union of Domestic Workers in a North Indian city of Jaipur. Deep into the pandemic, six months after the first lockdowns, we surveyed 501 domestic workers trying to understand what the lockdown had done to the quality of their employment and the dignity of their life. I'm not presenting that work here. What I'm presenting to you is actually an articulation of one part of the workers' lives, which is not where they worked, but where they lived. These are domestic workers that on average had lived in Jaipur for 18 years. Some of them had lived here for over 40 years. No one had lived in the city for less than 10 years. But when you looked at the, the bottom part, the bottom red box, which is how many of them had a identification card from the state of Rajasthan, from the province, what you can think of a local ID, not a federal or a national or a central ID, only 33% of them had any registration that placed them in the city of Jaipur where they had lived all their lives. What they had in many ways then were identity cards of other places. Now in one way, one can think of them as migrant workers, but this category of migrant fails to understand workers that have been settled in these cities for nearly two decades. And I'll come back to this question. I point this out because when the COVID pandemic hit, and the government of Rajasthan, where Jaipur is located, was trying to give welfare and relief 
to domestic workers, it could not do so because they did not exist for it in paper formally as residents of the state. The barrier to social protection access to care was not eligibility, was not worthiness, was not means testing or merit testing. It was an operational barrier of the impossibility of proving your residence in a home you have lived in for 20 years. And when I speak about the entrenchment of spatial informality, it is residence as a barrier to access, an operational barrier to access that stops a right that is given and entitled from actually being delivered. You will see similarly in the red box above that 67% that of them, the only form of proof of employment, any proof that they were workers at all, was because they were members of a union. So not a state recognition, not a statutory recognition, not a legal recognition, not a contractual recognition. So the context of economic and spatial informality for these domestic workers means that neither can they prove that they are in place as residents and therefore entitled to place-based social protection, nor can they prove that they are workers and therefore entitled to work-based social protection. And this is what economic and spatial informality do together to thinking about access to delivery of social protection systems. So when residence acts as an operational barrier to the delivery of social protection systems, we understand how the particular urban condition of the presence of workers in auto-constructed cities creates rights that cannot be delivered even if they are constitutionally held. What we see is that the debate on access to social protection is often about the difficulty of giving benefits to migrants because of their mobility. This is not that story. These are settled residents of cities, but they are settled not in the formal registers of the state. In one way, Palestinian architects and urbanists, Alessandro Petty and Sandy Hilal, used to use the term permanent temporariness to understand the refugee settlements of the Hesha in Jordan where Palestinians lived. In one way, permanent temporariness actually equally explains the conditions of many workers in Indian cities who are formal citizens, but not formal residents. And the distinction between citizenship and residence fractures our thinking operationally on the questions of universal social protection. Therefore, in one way, I want to urge us to think about not just what rights, what entitlements, but where those rights can be accessed. Fundamentally, these same workers could have returned to their villages and accessed the same rights they were denied in the cities, which is why many of them were on highways. The spatiality of where rights can be claimed is a distinct operational battle from the possession of those rights themselves. And one of the most important things politically is that in moments where you have a formal job with the contract, say in a manufacturing unit, but live in spatial informality, you can at least leverage one against the other, which means you can say, I may not have proof of residence or a written rental agreement, but I do have a work card from my employer and therefore I am legitimate, visible, recognized, present. These are our key words. But when you have neither proof of employment nor formality of residence, you have an inability to counter spatial informality with economic informality. Let me get to the next idea of work. When COVID started, I was asked by the government of Delhi to join a committee to determine emergency relief measures, particularly focusing on hunger, but also income transfers to informal workers. Similarly, immediately to us, an operational challenge was met. We were willing in the government committee to give 5,000 rupees cash transfer as emergency relief to workers. The question was, how do we find workers to give the relief to? This is an operational question. The question was, which database which recognition, which bank account, which worker, and think again about the domestic workers that lack any form of employment ID except the membership of the union, in which they are very rare. So we started with a very simple question. How do you find people to give a right to? It's a quite puzzling problem to face in a deeply unequal world. And when we started, we started with known categories. 
we had India has one of the largest public distribution food systems in the world. And we were able to give relief to everyone who held a food card. We had a list of people who received pension from the state. They immediately got relief, extra pension in their bank account. India runs one of the largest public works programs in the world where 100 days of guaranteed paid employment is given to every adult member of every household every year, but only if you live in rural areas. This program does not exist in the urban and the first urban employment programs have in fact started after COVID, a fact that I think is not a coincidence. And when you think then again about the spatiality of rights, now what has changed in a lot of movements and places in the Indian labor market over the last 20 years is that informality's old story of being invisible or parallel has ended. In fact, recent victories by workers have meant that we in the government at that point had multiple options to act because we had registered informal paratransit workers, we had registered street vendors, we had registered construction workers. Because each of these forms of entitlement had recently created new labor legislation that allowed a certain enumeration. We knew that the databases we had actually represented only a fraction of the total number of workers, but at least there was some place to begin. Here is where you see the shifting scale between visibility and recognition, where formal, informal workers begin to become legible to the state in a way that allows the delivery of rights. But in fact, what happened in COVID is testimony to the paucity of language and the paucity of categories. And government orders across the states, and this comes from a report where we looked at 150 government orders that gave relief across state and national governments, started using multiple ways and new categories. Daily wages, migrant workers, hawkers, contractual workers, marginal sections of society who have been deprived of their daily wages during the lockdown period. This was a moment in which a state was frantically searching for language to describe workers that it long knew existed, but before the pandemic had never bothered to recognize. Operationally, these were workers for whom legibility to the state did not exist. And the danger here goes back again. On the left side, you have known beneficiaries of social protection, either on the basis of need, pension, food cards, or on the basis of work, construction cards, street vending cards, transport recognition. But on the right, you have a similar dilution of the political claims where claims of vulnerability become the primary basis of claims of rights. What do we make of this moment of practice where one cannot find workers in order to give them rights that one even at that point wants to try and do? In many ways, registration is similar as an operational barrier like res res residence gave us earlier. In many ways, the most important point I want to make about this is that this is a political rather than technical question. Many times the question of formalizing informal work or registering informal workers, recognizing informal workers is reduced to being a technical question. You find the right app, the right digital technology, the right enumeration, and we will fix the problem. Indeed, many operational questions are often given technical answers, a paucity in our scholarship that I think is deeply troubling to me because very often operational questions are deeply political ones, not technical ones. For example, recognizing and registering informal workers does not just give undiluted gains of visibility, it also exposes workers to legibility that comes with risks, that comes with costs. Workers navigate informal employment, both for the distance from the state they need to not be over-regulated or improperly regulated. Because remember, regulation also comes with costs and taxes and standards and norms and fines, just as the lack of visibility renders them vulnerable like it did in COVID. So I don't cite the COVID relief example to make a plea for universal registration and recognition. That would be something that ignores what informal workers' movements have been saying for a long time, that the tension, the balance between the gains and costs of visibility have to constantly be calibrated, which is precisely why it's a political rather than technical question. 
Um, Kate Marga and Andres Dutroit have long spoken about the risks of what they call adverse incorporation that recognition into formal systems of labor regulation come with more costs than they do with gains. But at the same time, the pandemic and the needs of social protection remind us that too much of an opacity from the state also renders workers vulnerable in a different direction. How do we resolve these trade-offs? How do we think through these two different claims and pulls? These are the questions of scholarship that we must embed ourselves in. Because the question should be not a binary between recognition or formalization, but as the National Federa International Federation of Informal Workers called WIGO has argued, on the terms of recognition and the terms of formalization. What do you recognize? On what terms? What do you recognize workers as? How do you protect some of the flexibility of informal employment that then does not create new barriers for entry for new workers? But how do you also recognize workers enough to deliver care, deliver social protection, deliver labor entitlements? These are debates that we have to have without looking for technical shortcuts. But in any debate we have, what we must remember is that operationalizing social protection depends on certain forms of resolution. And often our analytical or normative debates undermine the operational requirements of delivering a system and not just having rights on paper. The second part I want to bring back to is again the question of who we claim as. A second tension in this story about recognition then is in India, recognition has not proceeded universally. It is not a recognition of labor. What's really interesting in, in our informal worker movements is that this is not a more familiar labor politics. There is a distinction between these categories of labor and worker that seems to be emerging. One that I don't fully understand, but I think is pivotal. If so much of our previous understanding of a certain welfare state or developmental imagination has been built around the political subjectivity of either the labor or citizen, what happens when labor becomes worker? What happens when different sectors of informal employment get protections in patchworks? Is this an incremental way to build rights? Is this us stepping back from the universalism of labor movements? I'm not certain, but I think it's worth thinking about these questions of who are we claiming as and what are the political subjectivities that can bear the weight of rights and of delivery. The second question, again, from the Indian context, particularly vexed, is, is work the primary identity of workers? One of the big debates between movements in India that organize around work versus movements that organize around identity like caste, gender, or religion, or region, is a distinction between economic political subjectivity and social political subjectivity. So in many cases, for example, during relief, it was much more effective to work with organizations workers belonged to, which were often very different from worker organizations. And I will say this one more time because I think it bears repeating. Most workers belong to organizations that are not worker organizations. They're not labor organizations. They're in fact organizations structured around caste, gender and religious and regional identities. They are what we would think of as social rather than economic or labor-based. In many of the debates around the left versus identity politics globally, this is a running characteristic. And it's worth thinking a little bit about the basis of mobilization and whether operations of rights need to expand their understanding of political subjectivities beyond the idea of the worker, but the idea of the person who has multiple intersectional identities they hold as dearly as the identity of their labor. And finally, one of the things that I think is really important is to think a little bit about the practicalities of building databases. Now, these seem as innocuous technical sites, but if you read the work of designers like Shannon Mattern um, and her really excellent text, The City is Not a Computer, she reflects on how forms of design and knowledge, the design of information architectural databases, a contemporary feature of contemporary life, itself again holds a deep political ethos. And thinking about not just the terms of recognition, but the information architectures of databases that then bring up questions of privacy, questions of applicability, questions of surveillance, 
are deeply important sites of labor politics. Um, they are not often thought as, but they must be thought as, because if we are concerned about the delivery of social protection to workers, the information and technological artifices that are the infrastructure of this delivery need interrogation and need to be thought as sites that make meaning and make politics and are not just digital or technological assemblages that neutrally deliver us efficiently to digital outcomes. My final category is the workplace. And here we think actually again of the question of not where workers ask rights from, but in fact, where can rights be given to them? One of the final conditions of economic and spatial informality is that it's not just that worker identities are not recognized as workers or that workers' homes are not recognized as residents, but the places they work are not recognized as workplaces. And you'll remember that in the beginning framework of place, work, workplace, one of the fundamental structures of, say, the European social security system is that the employment relationship is the delivery mechanism of social protection. It is the employer that not just guarantees that work under government regulation, but delivers it along with the wage relation. What happens then when workplaces where workers should be easily found, easily accessed, should be the ideal place where you give workers benefits? What happens when those workplaces themselves are unrecognized by the state? So I'll give you three examples. This is Delhi, and this is work done by the Social Design Collective. And what you see here is 272 what we call weekly markets, what unions often call natural markets, markets that pop up sometimes only for a day, sometimes for five days a week, some are permanent, some are semi-permanent, they come up, they go down. They are where street vendors in particular congregate. Many of these markets work on deeply under-recognized relationships with the state. Some have some form of licenses, none have any right of permanent stay, none have any guaranteed right of repeating and coming back every Tuesday, even though that's their day. There is a great deal of exchange and negotiation with the armed, um, with the police and the state in order to remain. And this map was made actually in order to try and push the next Delhi master plan, the 2041 master plan, to finally put workplaces of street vendors into the map itself. A similar example, these are 188 dry waste collection centers where waste pickers sort and aggregate recycle waste, slowly finding their way onto some form of municipal recognition with IDs issued to waste pickers and the centers recognized by the municipal government, but they still find no recognition on any spatial and master plans of Bangalore's development. The third, one of the hardest ways of thinking about the most invisibilized form of work is home-based work. Home-based work is one of the most predominant forms of gendered and women's work in South Asia. And South Asia has some of the largest number of home-based workers in the world. Now, home-based workers are spatially invisible doubly because they aren't even congregating in markets or for example, in waste recycling sites, but they work contractually within their own homes. Now, in many cases, one may argue that if one works within the own home, there is no distinct workplace, in fact, map. But what maps such as these show you is that home-based work tends to cluster in homes with particular spatial patterns. In fact, what they tends to do is to cluster precisely on the border of industrial outsourcing areas which means that their infrastructure requirements, their recognition of a workplace is absolutely possible, similar to other spatial patterns. But in many cases, they are invisibilized within residential fabrics. And what you will see here is just three small lanes of a neighborhood in Delhi, and you will see every fifth house that's actually part of a different kind of supply chain, even though these environments are not prepared or recognized as spaces of employment. And so what you will see here is you have contractors, you have warehouse workers, you have thread cutting, embroidery, embellishment. And in fact, many of them are then linked to global garment supply chains that enter in, for example, to the production of denim. So this is multi-scale of global work, but at the city scale is invisibilized in space. What this means is that one of the most efficient ways 
to reach informal workers. And remember, we're struggling to find them in contracts. We're struggling to find them in labor databases. We're struggling to find them in citizen databases. We don't have them in formal housing. We don't have them in a rental housing database. At the very least, we should be able to simply go where they work and find them and deliver social protection entitlements. But we can't do that because while we know where they work, we don't recognize or acknowledge those workplaces. But informal workplaces have spatial patterns. And some of the work that many people in Indian cities have been doing is to unearth those spatial patterns and make them visible to the state. Without that, those workplaces remain as vulnerable to eviction on one hand, and also to the lack of any infrastructural support on the other. What would it take to use workplaces as sites of delivery? What would it take to reconfigure our imaginal social protection, leave the industrial North Atlantic origins of delivering through workplaces, relying on the employment relation, and reimagine social protection without the work contract and without the official workplace? In India, when the COVID lockdown anthem of work from home was started, it was ironic for home-based workers. But in many folks were that could not understand is that for many workers, public space was precisely where work occurred. Work from home was only possible for a tiny minority of our labor markets, yet our regulations asked and spoke only to them. I want to give you a little bit of a counter example that when we think about what it means to insert and follow workers where they are, what would that look like? So let me give you three practices to close. The first is what we call a mohalla clinic in Delhi. Mohalla is a, is a Hindi, Urdu, Persian, Arabic word for neighborhood. And um, when you speak of a mohalla clinic, the imagination of the government of Delhi was to build effectively a deeply local health center, a center that would be very close to where people were, particularly to where workers were. And in fact, what the first 50 or so of the clinics that were built looked like this. Architects and planners would be happy. There's a clean plot. It has a boundary. There's a ramp. It's got steps. It has the right size. The setbacks are correct. The development control regulations are correct. The norms are followed. I say this with surprise because as an Indian urbanist and urban residents, whenever we see a building that looks like it's drawing, we're always like, what happened? Something must have gone wrong. But let's say it worked and was built nicely. Now, the problem is because they built it nicely and to code and by regulation, after building the first 50, they said we have no place to build anymore. Because in a city built in auto construction, you cannot find neat, rectangular, empty plots of land that meet code. There is no reason if every citizen cannot follow the planning law that the state should be in any better position. So the state reaches 100 clinics and pauses. It wants to build a thousand, but how does it find land in a city to build another 900? What it has to do is to start thinking like workers themselves, which is you get in, you build what you can quickly, where you can and hope for the best. Therefore, the next clinics are like this. Now, this is a classic image of this road behind my house, okay? You see a informal street vendor, on the footpath where he's not supposed to be next to a government clinic on the same footpath where it is not supposed to be. Because what the government realized that the only way to build at scale, but to build where workers are is to encroach and occupy public space exactly like the workers had done. Now, this is a logic of delivery, of operationalization that is very different from our current ways of designing systems which is to say that if you root the practices in particular contexts, sometimes you have to act against every bit of technical best practice to get the job done. Now, the danger, of course, is that the state can't quite get away with it the way citizens can. So indeed, the central government told the government of Delhi, they don't like each other, opposition parties, that we are going to demolish this because this is an illegal encroachment. By law, they are 100% correct. That is a footpath. You can see the bus stop behind it. It is absolutely an illegal encroachment. Rather than defend that it was indeed not an encroachment, the government of Delhi gave an ingenious answer. 
it said it's not an encroachment because it is not a structure at all. There is no brick, there is no weight. This is a temporary structure that can be folded down tomorrow if you like. Therefore, we have not built anything at all. This is absolutely the logic of informal housing. You build temporarily, incrementally, you survive, you regularize 10 years later, and you keep building enough not to attract attention. So the tension between visibility and recognition and the terms of recognition were precisely the moves made by the state. A state that thought about itself acting with a very different logic because it prioritized operationalizing the delivery of a social protection infrastructure. This is a health clinic. Right? And found ways to get there that worked in our context. It is this kind of practice that I think comes from a different imagination. I am struck by this clinic every day because I don't know, including myself, any policy advisor, any academic, any practitioner who would have the guts to advise the state to simply encroach public space to build health centers. None of us would put this on paper. We would not defend it in journals. Reviewer two would kill us. But in fact, it is the only operational practice that has scaled. And today, 700 more clinics were built precisely like this, next to waste yards, under flyovers, next to bus stations where the transport workers were, next to construction sites, inserted into dense urban villages, put in the middle of informal settlements, all without regard to code, saying just go where people are. And in many ways, that logic of daring to reconfigure certain conditions of care, make a radical potential, not just for other actors, but also for the state. I have a couple of other ideas on practices, but I'm at time, so I'm not gonna go to them, but I'm happy to pick them up. I'll tell you very quickly about them. One is a way to rethink residence in law, which is uh, uh, an action that we were part of, which changed the way in which residence was understood and did not ask people how many years they had lived in the city or what paperwork they had, but accepted them on the legal principle of the intent to reside, which basically said that if you can prove that you intend to reside, you are included in social protection. You don't have to actually reside for a period of time. And I can discuss this in questions. Um, I also wanted to share some work around different spatial databases. This is a database of where and in what ways domestic workers live in rental housing. And I'll come back to that later. And this is a, a third example of a new government of India initiative that allows all workers to register as workers regardless of the contractual nature of their employment and doesn't differentiate by sector. So it is in fact, one of the few universal self-declaration based worker registration systems that takes your word if, if you say you're a domestic worker and doesn't ask you for any proof, which could be an interesting structural shift in the way worker registration takes place, but there's a lot of problems with this, I'll come back. But let me close only on the point of care. So I just want to reiterate that what I've been trying to offer today is to think about social protection as a structural expression of care and arguing that pushing social protection to its transformative potential allows us to take both care and social protection as ways to take on urban inequality rather than think only of them as safety nets or of provisions of horizontal solidarity. At the same time, I want us to be very careful to think about the fact that this care can be structural only if it is equally radical in its ability to actually exist. In in saying that, what I mean is that when you look at social protection from urban India, the fact that the system delivers at all is transformative in itself because of the deep constraints of majority vulnerability of economic and spatial informality. We are unable to deliver the rights we already possess, but I fear often that our attention both as activists and as scholars is to expand the basket of rights, which is essential work, but equal attention has to be on the delivery of those rights. And that delivery has to be deeply contextualized to particular forms of urbanism, to particular political and social contexts. 
And I hope that what I've shown you is that questions that ask where does care work occur are as important as thinking about the, the question of care itself. And that if the question of operationalizing care does not receive as much attention as its critique or analysis, then we will do half the work that we have to do in order to actually use the full potential of these concepts to think about a structural reshaking and reshaping of urban inequality. Um, and I will stop with that, uh, with many thanks to Maria for the translation. Thank you, Professor Ban, for your uh, very inspiring presentation. It connected with a lot of our interests, uh, with a lot of our uh, work in Bogota, and with the dialogue we are trying to uh, initiate with the European cities too. Uh, we have 64 people uh, in this Zoom meeting, uh, uh, some more people watching in Facebook Live, and we have a group of students connected from the uh, classroom. So uh, thank you very much because this, uh, this helps us to expand our analysis. Uh, next, we are going to give uh, the word to uh, anybody who wants to comment in English first, because when, uh, when we give the word uh, to those who will comment in Spanish, both uh, Gautam and those uh, of you who want to hear uh, the English version will have to switch to the English channel. So uh, to be more organized, first we will give uh, the word to those who want to speak in English. So if you have comments, questions, please raise your hand. Uh, I'm seeing Maho raising her hand from the classroom. Uh, Roger, could you activate the audio? to those who are raising their hand. This, the first is Semillero Urbano Uniandes, which is our group of students. Adelante, Majo. Yeah. Hola, hello. Um, thank you, Gaudam, for your presentation. Uh, you made me think of many things, as Adriana was saying, this relates a lot with what, the, the care blocks were studying in, in Bogota. And I could relate the health clinics with the buses of care that they implemented also during the pandemic when infrastructure was not enough. So a lot, lots of connections. But I want to go back to, I, I want to make some comments. First, I, I want to go back to one point you made at the beginning that raising the 50 bottom, 50% in the bottom is different from, um, taking from the 1%. And I understand, but I wanted you to expand a little bit more because those things are related in many ways because you need the money to, from the 1% or from the 20% uh, to raise the bottom 50%. And, and I'm sure you agree, but I wanted you to say it yourself. And, um, and then the second point has to do with universal, with basic universalism, which is, I think, which is something the World Bank uh, spoke about in the 90s and then they forgot. And I think it, it has a lot to do with what you said and, and what with what might be the solution for, for informal economies, countries and cities to have some sort of welfare capacity, to have some services that are universal. And then on top of that, you build things. But, but I think it's the only way and those universal rights have to be universal as the word says. So it, 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 they, those rights, health rights, education rights, whatever, or universal income uh, will have to be provided depending on being a citizen or, or a person, not even a citizen with so many migrants um, and not on the basis of work. And the third point, if I'm remembering, oh yeah, I, I wanted you to, to comment on the risks of this um, encroaching of the welfare state. Because what I, I see is that, I mean, we have to put politics into this. And, and it's risky to think that someone can trust on these low quality services to provide more services and gain more votes 
um, I don't know, uh, what happens when we bring politics into this in terms of clientelism and the quality of services and the, it's tempting, right? If I'm a politician, I'll, I'll put a lot of informal clinics out there and gain a lot of votes without guaranteeing the quality of the services. Um, you, you don't have to answer all of this. Just I, I, I just wanted to bring this into the conversation and thank you for making us think um, about care as, as, as a structural protection. I think that's a powerful idea. Thank you. Thank you. You want to answer? Sure, I'll be brief. Um, so, so absolutely, right. The 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 macro structural distribution of economic power, the question of the one percent, deeply drives the existence of the bottom fifty percent. What what I meant about it being distinct is actually an operational distinction. The ways in which you raise the floor, the speed of that change. I think can be done in some ways, regardless of how quick the change is for the top 1%. I'll give you an example of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is our neighboring country just to the South in India. Sri Lanka grew at 4% GDP for two decades in the midst of a deep civil war. It also has some of the best human development indicators in the world. India grew at 12%, 10%, 11%, and many parts of it have some of the worst human development indicators in the world. And I think of the contrast in this, what I mean to say is that while the both are deeply connected, operationally, when you have, when your bottom 50% lives in conditions of deep destitution, then some part of basic capability work has to occur without waiting for macroeconomic redistribution. Um, and also that some parts of the policy practice of raising the floor, India has adequate public spending to do much better for the bottom 50% than it does now. We just don't use that spending well. We should have twice that amount of spending for which you need that larger structural macro readjustment. I totally agree. So the way I think of it sometimes is this. I think that the prevention of destitution is very much independent of the top 1%, but the guarantee of socioeconomic mobility beyond that is not. So mobility cannot be guaranteed without macroeconomic change, but destitution can be prevented without macroeconomic change. And I think that because in Southern cities where I speak from, which is why I, I want to say that I'm not theorizing inequality, I'm theorizing inequality in India. With us, the question is that you know, if I look at where Latin American countries were in the 1980s, before 10 years of a certain welfare imagination, those kinds, uh, you know, Indian income inequality is now worse than Brazil's. And it wasn't until 2011, because in Brazil, the wages of the bottom 30% rose. Its inequality also rose because the wages of the top 10% rose five times more. But life for the bottom 50% is better. And to me, that's not an insignificant argument. So I'm focused on that question, but my own optimism in raising the floor will end quickly when questions of mobility come up. The ceiling is very quick, but that work still has to be done. On the question of universalism, I will say, again, the distinction to me is conceptually, I'm very happy for rights to be claimed universally. But when universal is the principle of delivery, then it's always the same set of people who get left out. There's always a 10, 15% error rate, and that error rate is always particular. It's always the informal settlements, always the marginalized caste groups, always the minority groups. So universal delivery seems to have an ability to hold deep differentiation in actual outcomes. So in some ways, I wonder, and I'm honestly struggling with this question, but unions in India have made this call that operational delivery works better if you stick to your own sector. Construction workers won their own act. Street vendors won their own act. They did not mobilize together as a universal claim for workers. Now, the danger of that, of course, is that you fracture publics. So it comes at a cost. But operationally, it seems to be more efficient as a delivery mechanism. Every time we have delivered universally, we have massive leaks. But when we deliver specifically, now there's a difference here again on what you I when I when you organize around work status. The other part I want to say is that I worry about 
claims based on citizenship and residence on the universalism, because then it very quickly depoliticizes social protection. And increasingly, we deliver to beneficiaries, not to citizens. So I feel sometimes it's very important that rights be given to workers, because informal workers are anyways erased as workers. Their identity, their contribution, their productivity is undermined, then means that their work protections and labor rights are never given either. So to hold on to the recognition of work is very important about how that social protection is perceived. And we have seen this in debates in the US between debates between rights and welfare. So again, I sort of, I find myself holding on to that claim to say, I don't know how much I want it to be universal. I want at least some social protection to be given to workers because they are workers and because the work they do should be recognized. Um, but I very much go back and forth and think and struggle with this the same way. And the last point I'll simply make is that I will say I have never quite understood the fear about clientelism. Uh, it's a concept I really struggle with. I, I know that a lot of Latin American political science has this. I would love voters to vote for services. It would be a dream in Indian democracies for governments to get elected because they provided a health clinic. I wish that was the case. I wish this clientelism existed. We vote on everything else other than services. We vote on religion, we vote on identity, we vote on nationalism, we vote on the color of the flag. This Delhi government gets repeatedly re-elected, finally, because it provided services. So I'm not, I, I don't have the fear of dependency that this idea of clientelism evokes. I think that voters are absolutely able to make rational choices and say, he's trying to give me a clinic, I'll vote for him. And if I elect him, he may give me more clinics. I don't see the fight. And so I have to say, I've always struggled with this this idea of clientelism because it also seems to apply only to the poor. The rich constantly vote in clientelistic ways for parties that will favor capital that comes to them. I don't see why it's any different. So maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but I don't quite get it. And all I will say there is that the structure of the clinic may look temporary, but the services are excellent. The tests are good, the drugs are free, the doctors are accredited. So the quality of service is not affected. The reason the clinics have to be slightly precarious looking is that they have to be very, very close to very precarious housing. Workers, if workers cannot walk to them in five minutes, they're not getting used. And therefore, you, if you're going to be in an informal settlement, actually they look like they're part of the settlement, which has made them deeply affected. They are the most popular health intervention we have seen in this country for a long time. And their services have been evaluated by places like the Lancet and the British Medical Journal as being excellent public health facilities. So there's no facility compromise here at all. Um, there's a structural appearance distinction, which I actually think is a strategic plus rather than a minus. Thank you. Uh, we have Federica and Natalia and then Agustina. I don't know if it's easier if you just uh, uh, do your comments, the three of you, and then we will go back to Gaudi. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Gautam, for this um, uh, talk, which was really very interesting and inspiring. And I think it talks to a lot of things we have been researching here, Adriana, Maho, and I, with the students also, um, with the Manzanas de Cuidado. And um, so lots of things to talk about and think about. Um, and I was thinking we should really do a comparative study between India and Colombia. I think there would be uh, lots of interesting comparisons and similarities, but also differences. Um, my question goes to actually your second answer to uh, Maho's comments. Um, if there, one of the problems of care is not also um, um, an exaggerated faith in legalization of services. And I'm saying this because um, like I did research about um, domestic employees or domestic workers. And the problem is, for example, uh, Colombia has a very progressive legal frame of protecting and guaranteeing rights for domestic workers. But the problem is they cannot be enforced because uh, in the private home where women work, um, the state has no access. And so it doesn't really help them. And so I think the solution should actually be, for example, a universal income or something like that. 
um, because the legal frame just doesn't work in these situations. And so I think very often practitioners, politicians, but also activists have this incredible faith in legalization and rights, which in many informal contexts actually don't work because they, they cannot get there where the issue is and where the problem is. And many informal um, practice solutions to care necessities cannot be regulated by laws. So that's for me attention there. Thank you. Yeah. Natalia? Um, yeah, thank you, Gautam, for a very, very interesting and inspiring uh, talk. Uh, my internet connection is very unstable, so apologies in advance if I just disappear. I hope it won't happen. So now to my to my question. Um, I wanted to ask about the, the relation between care and, and inequality. If I got it right, you suggested that taking care seriously and like also thinking about how to operationalize care is, is a way to uh, undo uh, urban inequalities. But um, some say, like for example, John Tronto, that, that care exists and um, is needed because the inequalities exist. And also inequality is actually inherent to relationship of care where one is, yep in need of care and cannot care for for themselves so what is what is the relationship there um thank you and agustina yes hello thank you again for the presentation um i'm sorry but i have a sore throat so if i'm not clear i can write down my my question on the i don't know if you can hear me well you're yeah. fine yeah. okay uh so um i think it would be really interesting to make a comparative uh study as well um as Federico was saying um i'd like to add a question from our experience in our research uh well mercedes de Virgilio and i have been working during the pandemic with a case of a local government who decided to uh, somehow work with organizations that we call social workers, uh, workers from the social economy, actually, that's how we're calling them in Argentina. I'm not sure if this is like an international trend or it is a concept that we use uh, locally, but we use this concept to refer to those actors who work in the, it wouldn't be just the informal economy, but also like the vulnerable and informal uh, sector. So this uh, local government came out with the idea of uh, making this alliance or like a way of joint collaboration with these organizations uh, mm -hmm. who basically work uh, on care activities like um, dining rooms and uh, kindergartens, and they're all uh, um, spontaneously um, built. I mean, they're not uh, part of any formal institution. And they came with this idea of collaborating to, um, well, try to find a way to solve these uh, problems and uh, have more social. Um, protection in this territory. So my question is if you have been thinking or if you have any cases of this um, collaboration, I mean, between this uh, with the citizenship and the state or the public policy. policy. Thank you. Thank you, Agustina. So, so let me take these together. They're, they're, mm -hmm. I do no justice to any of them, but I will try. Uh, the so on on the first point, Federica, to your point, I, I think that's exactly why I'm trying to emphasize the need to experiment and think more deeply about operationalizing. Because I honestly, I think at this point, legislative Im Im you know expansion um, is not the fight. I think there are some places. So I, I in our work, I try to divide it in two ways. 
I think it's worth fighting for more legislative recognition of more radical social protection elements like transportation costs, like rent, like higher education. That's where the legislative, because there a legislative expansion would open new horizons, right? We'll struggle to operationalize those also, but that's a fight worth fighting. I would love to fight to figure out a system on how to discount rent costs for workers. We've been trying to do it in India. Statisticians have been trying to get reasonable rent costs into the estimations of our state urban poverty lines, for example. The state resists it bitterly because it would triple the number of, poor. basically, if you added rent costs to Indian poverty line numbers, 70% of the city would be poor. And the state knows this, so they will refuse to see it. So I think that further legal emancipation fight should be focused on new entitlements that are transformative free public higher education, rent, child care, particularly public child care, which I think is an absolutely pivotal. Uh, in India, we've made some progress on this. Everyone is only talking about child care because um, we have one of the lowest women's labor force participation rates in the world, and it's falling while India is growing, right? So everyone is obsessed. It is the only data point that I have heard the National Alliance of People's Movements the government of India and the World Bank all agree upon and agree to discuss is women's labor force participation rate. So we are using it strategically to sneak in all kinds of social infrastructure, including public child care. Um, I think that the question of, you know, the and domestic workers, so this is where the empirical specificity of operationalization is so key. What will work for construction will not work for domestic work simply because the workplace is configured differently. So that's why I think that when I think of universalization, I worry because the operational conditions of work are so different by sector that it is good for construction workers to get what they can. They're all on the same site with one contractor while domestic workers take different routes. Now with domestic workers, we have found with the union that legal recognition is very insufficient for wage protection but it is very useful for protection of employer-based sexual and domestic violence. And one of the biggest concerns for domestic workers is workplace sexual violence. In fact, one of the greatest reasons why domestic workers leave work is because of violence within the employer's home. So, you know, it's also to me, again, the question of which are the operationalizing what rights requires what form. And I think that's where, to me, I, what, with, what I'm urging us to do is to not a priori have positions on what will work for what, but radically experiment operationally. Because when one practices, you know, the, the domestic workers union I'm talking about was formed not as a wage collective bargaining union. It was formed because the women intervened into sexual violence within the workplace and then became a wage arguing union. So to me, there's a lesson in that union history about different conditions of what legalization of what kind and so oddly in India, one of the first informal workers that entered our sexual violence laws were domestic workers with no operational mechanism in sight, obviously, right? Where do you go? No labor inspector, et cetera. But at the same time, that recognition, even though it had no operational mechanism, allowed unions and the police to effectively intervene in cases of violence, right? So it was not the mechanism imagined, but a new operational mechanism emerged because that right was legislated and they were recognized as a workplace. So it was funny, domestic workers workplace is not recognized under labor law. It's recognized under laws regulating sexual violence. This is a strange operational move to me, but these are the kinds of things that are moving on the ground. And I think we have to pay different attention to their possibilities. They're absolutely imperfect. They are incremental, they're multi-directional, but that's the way so are our cities. So to me, our moves are not going to be distinct from our urban context. And I think that's the kind of openness and inventiveness I'm trying to think a little bit with. I absolutely share no great faith in legalization per se, um, but I also recognize, so the question to me is where is that fight better? Where is delivery better? Where is it a question of just focusing on rights? Where, and, and to really allow a deep variation in those kinds of moves um, without going one way or the other. Um, and I think that, um, Augustina, to answer your question, one of the ways, so the domestic workers in Jaipur got the cash transfer during COVID. 
because the union gave a list of 3,000 bank accounts to the labor department and said, we'll tell you where the workers are. So one of the other pieces of work we've been doing is to say, why should it be the state that is the only delivery agent of social protection? What are the other non-state actors that become a kind of delivery arrangement or assemblage? And why can't worker organizations take on the work of delivering social protection if workplaces are not tenable? So again, in domestic workers' case, many domestic workers in, uni uh, in India deliver social protection on behalf of the employers, but they are not the state. And so there's an accountability there. But for that, the union scale has certain limits. Now, Indian unions can be very large. Um, the Self-Employed Women's Association has 1.75 million women traders. So these are not small scales. Um, so even the idea of saying, you know, citizens working with the state, when you expand that notion of non-state actors to more than just citizens and care workers, but to really large federations and cooperatives of workers, those are formidable actors. So to me, the other operational question should really be to radically experiment with non-state actors new deliveries. So formal workers always got protection, not from the state, they got it from their employers, right? Like we do from our universities. Um, why should workers not get it from their unions, if not from their employers? But for that, the unions themselves have to, you know, take a good hard look in the mirror. I don't need to tell anyone in this call about the state of unions in much of the world. But in India, what's been super exciting for us is that the largest growing associations in the country are cooperatives and federations of informal workers. And I think there's a reason for that. I think there's a, there's a politics behind that. There's a claims behind that. Um, and that goes back then to the question, um, Natalia, that you asked about care and inequality. So I think I will distinguish between a kind of horizontal notion of care and a vertical notion of care. I think a horizontal notion of care speaks to many articulations of it in terms of solidarity, in terms of mutual aid, in terms of, um, of, of taking folks along, in terms of not letting economic productivity be the only definition of accessing dignified life, etc. But I think when you think of care vertically, then you think about what are those infrastructures that make that solidarity possible. And I also think it's important to say what are things that should not be left to communities? I am all for celebrating the agency and reliance and resilience of communities. I also think that resilience becomes an excuse to make people do work that public systems should do. And I really, I mean, in Bombay, there's a really lovely poster every monsoon because everyone talks about the resilience of the city and the people. And, and at one point they said, we do not want to be resilient anymore. We would like to be cared for. We would just like infrastructure. We are tired of fighting and being brave through our flooded streets every year. No one wants this heroism. Because to me, that's the point. Heroism is the antithesis of solidarity. It is nothing to be celebrated that people were brave. People should not need to be brave to have dignity. Bravery should not require you to be an exemplary human being. You should be the most banal person in the world and still be handed dignity. And so to me, this question, and so I feel like I worry about some of the celebration of mutual aid and solidarity is almost a defense of state abdication. You know, it's, you know, one person's freedom is another person's abandonment. And so to me, I really want to sort of take seriously the fact that the responsibility of care, you cannot, I at least cannot take it away from the state, not at this point, not in the, not the public systems must do it. You know, so much of my work on housing informality, of course, workers are resilient when they slowly and incrementally build low income housing, but the cost of it is unsanctionable. Why should it take seven years to get drainage and sanitation in a, in a house in the periphery of the city? It shouldn't. And so the question then is, yeah, we can co-produce care outcome. Are we going to co-produce underground sewage drain networks? No, there are things that should be public systems. So I think that for me, if we articulate care at these two scales, then we say some things are not to be left to mutual aid and solidarity. Some things must be infrastructures of public right. 
And those things must define care infrastructures at a structural level within them, of course, and to close gaps between them to, you know, mutual aid and solidarity should lift us towards higher outcomes. It should not be our go-to. It should be the thing that pushes us to what Amartya Sen would, you know, when Amartya Sen wrote the capabilities framework, he distinguished between what he called basic functionings and needs and what he called flourishing. I have always loved that word in that theory, this idea of flourishing. To me, solidarity and horizontal care should be about flourishing. It should not be about capabilities. Capability should be automatic. And I think that this far we should come. So that's why I think that inequality causes us to reach for care. But I feel that is a move of desperation, not, not, a, not a move of satisfaction. I think it's with band-aids on much deeper woods. Thank you, Gautam. That last point was great and it resonated a lot with what we have been discussing from uh, in our work. Uh, do we have some any more questions or comments in English? I, I don't see more raised hands. Should we switch to a round of comments in Spanish before we close? Uh, if si van a hablar español, si tienen comentarios en español, por favor, levanten la mano para que el conferencista se cambie de canal. Si hay alguien, puede hacerlo ahora. I, I don't see any hands. Okay, so in English or in Spanish, be, feel free to comment, to ask. More questions? If not, uh, I think that was a good point uh, to close our conversation, but I want to give the opportunity to the public. Uh, there's some message in the chat, but okay, thank you. This was amazing. The recording will be available. Yes, we, we are transmitting live. Uh, in the Facebook page of the CIDER, I think. Uh, I will share the link now in the chat. Uh, I think the recording will be available in that Facebook page. Um, the other messages are all thanking you. Uh, so, yeah, I think, ah, no, Talia, go on. No, you have, you are silenced, Tali. No, you can hear me. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I've never got used to the digital. Um, Gautam, thank you so much for, for your talk. Well, I think we were talking about the workshop and thinking about inviting you. That was exactly what we were um, uh, hoping to, to continue our conversations about. I just wanted to chip in maybe that um, the, IG, the idea of focusing on the operationalization of care also opens up a lot of possibilities for discussing the North from the South. Yeah. Because I think it's exactly that we have, I have just done a little paper on how elementary school teachers tried to reach out to students during COVID. And they were told mm. by the local state to send the parents an email. Uh. They had no <laughs> clue at the city level that we have schools yeah. in Berlin where parents do not read. <laughs> emails or have email addresses and that there's they were forbidden to use WhatsApp has all sorts of issues with privacy and blah. So teachers were not allowed to write parents WhatsApp messages, whereas parents in their everyday lives, it's the only thing they do is use WhatsApp. So so I just wanted to point out that that it is that there's a huge potential, I think, to to think about that. And Hannah Schilling who I saw earlier, I don't know if she's still here, but has also been working on this in a, in a proposal that we never got the grant for, but that very much looked at the way in which those everyday logics and institutional logics are a complete mismatch. And I think there's so much to learn also on a policy level from yeah. the example that you gave of doing uh, doing things according to the deeply local and close to people. And I think the development of some of our institutions have been in the opposite direction. So thank you again. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I didn't want to sort of do the closing, I, but I wanted to say that that I think that that no, has no, been I... very relevant for, for my work, for Alberta's work, for Nina's work. So that was great. Thank you.
Thank you. No, I appreciate it. And I just, I, I, I want to say also, I think, um, you know, I think the two contexts around the North and the South that I think are very interesting to me is we are trying in India to learn a lot from the new European movements around remunicipalization and, you know, the kind of radical municipal reform movements. And I find them very, very thoughtful and inspiring and thinking about what it means to return service provision to the state after a long period of privatization. And so that's been really a lesson um, uh, in thinking about what we want to take from the North, because one part of the South that's often not understood as Southern urban is post-colonial governments, I'm generalizing, but at least in the Indian state, are very comfortable with deep centralization. Uh, and I think many Northern states are better at a kind of radical urban decentralization, city governments, urban local bodies are more powerful. And it's something that we've been trying. I think Latin America has an advantage of having very strong urban government traditions. In India, no one could name the mayor of a city. No one. I mean, it's uh, these, are, these are not political. I mean, the mayor of London becomes the prime minister of the UK within like three months. Uh, you, it's a very different story for us. And our constitutional settlement was deeply suspicious of the urban. And so rural decentralization is the strong goal, but urban decentralized, our municipalities are deeply disempowered. And I think we keep looking at other municipal structures, both to Latin America and also to Europe. And I think the other counter example that's really important is I think the North Atlantic labor markets are going through a kind of contractualization a kind of casualization of the employment relationship. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it's odd because in some ways, Indian labor markets never saw the standard employment relationship on which economics was based. We never had full employment as the dominant employment. So we have been handling various states of casualization for a long time and are much better at it. So in some ways, if you look at, take the example of Uber, Uber rights in India and mobilization are so effective. Um, we have national level protection for gig and platform workers that recognizes workers in our labor codes, like, you know, in the say, and I think that there's a lot for the North Atlantic to learn from countries where informal employment has been the dominant norm because we've lived various variations of the employment relationship. So we don't see, I mean, Uber in India is not casualization. It's actually formalization. Because it's the first, even that app contract is a recognition of employment, which is actually a degree of recognition, not a degree of precarity. So it's a very interesting sort of reverse thing. But I think that there's, in fact, I, I recently learned that a lot of unions in, um, a lot of unions in uh, the UK, the taxi drivers and Uber unions are actually consulting with Uber unions in India on, on labor strategy. And I think that's a very smart way to think counter. So. I think that what's very nice about the contemporary moment in some ways is that rather, I, I think the thinking from place is deeply important, but I think that in some ways that if we don't make certain a priori assumptions, some of these Northern and Southern labels will also become slightly less restrictive to us as just we think from multiple places at the same time. Um, and I think there's a lot we have to say to each other in many kinds of ways. So I'm I'm happy for that, and it's uh, our conversations have always helped me be a little less southern and a little just more urban in general. So I'm happy to see you here. Thank you. Ed. If there are no more comments, which I think are not, uh, well, we are very grateful uh, that you are all here today, but. Thank you very much, uh, Gautam, to, uh, for being with us at this late hour for you. We know it's uh, really, it's nighttime in India. So uh, I, I want to invite you all to, to participate in our next events. Uh, the discussion does not end here. Uh, we will be having more event, uh, another seminar, as, as I already said, in February and another one in at the end of May. So uh, thank you all for being here with us. And uh, I think we can close now. Bye. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.